Very good morning to all of you, and thank you, Elder Fong, for a very warm welcome. I couldn't recognize myself in the things you said, but as I reflected, I guess, if I were ever distinguished, I was distinguished for my silliness, I think, yeah, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Though silly, the Lord, in His mercy, called me, and I have served Him for all these many years. Perhaps the best thing I can do for His kingdom is to illustrate that if I can do it, you can too. If a man like me, you know, in all my stupidity and silliness can do something for the Lord, you can do more. Maybe that is what my ministry is all about. But thank you for this welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to bring God's word to you. Today, we want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. And we will be using this passage for our reflection today as we dive into God's word. The title of the sermon will be, The Lord Looks at the Heart. The Lord Looks at the Heart. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Allow me to read this passage to you once. So beginning from verse 1 of chapter 16, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, and go, I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And Samuel said, Peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6 now. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from the day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is a very important passage. It is important because you find written large the tendencies of human beings. You'll find yourself in the description. And not just that, not only does it reveal to us our tendencies, it also reveals to us, if we sit down and think about it, that we don't learn very well. 
even though we know the principle found in this passage, yet we repeat the mistake again and again and again. What's that principle? It is that the Lord looks at the heart, not the outward. We know it by heart, perhaps, but we don't seem to practice it. Well, why was this passage written and what story is it telling? If you look at the setting, the setting is a very solemn one. You already can sense by reading the text when Samuel visited the village and they say, do you come in peace? And Samuel said, yes, in peace. <laughs> you know what's happening because the political tension was great. How so? The nation wanted a king and they got a king by the name of Saul. He started very well, very impressive. A king that you can be proud of, a king that you can talk about, not a king that you would be shy you know, or ashamed just to mention his name. A king you are proud of. But this so-called outwardly impressive king did not press on or go on following the Lord. Soon, his agenda supersedes God's agenda. Soon, he became thinking about only of himself, no longer of the Lord. And the Lord rejected him. So it is a very important moment in Israel. The first kings rejected. Though impressive, the Lord said he was rejected. What now is the nation to do? They need a replacement. But this replacement is not easy to find. How can you find someone greater than Saul? It's not easy. So the Lord sent Samuel to, to, to Bethlehem to anoint someone who would succeed Saul. Of course, if Saul hears of it, Saul would put a stop to it and perhaps maybe slay all those in the village. And that's why the people ask Samuel, do you come in peace or not? <laughs> we don't want trouble, you know. And Samuel said, no trouble, we're just worshipping the Lord. And then as they worship, the Lord will identify someone to be anointed. So that's the setting. And the setting tells us how important it is people are in the kingdom of God. I say this not to glorify us, but it is God's idea that human beings play an important role in schemes, in plans, in God's kingdom even. So much so that for Israel to proceed along the path of God, a right person must be chosen. So they are there now, Samuel and his party and the others, they are there to choose the right person. And that's something we can identify with, right? You choose the wrong person for that ministry. Even though that ministry may be strong to start with, very soon it will collapse. You choose the right person, even though that ministry may be weak, over time it'll get stronger. Choosing the right person is so important. Not just for ministry, but for family too. You choose the right spouse, and that family will be blessed. You choose the wrong one. Oh dear, though the start is great, great honeymoon, great wedding party, you know, so joyful. But not very long after that, you see things falling apart. If choosing someone is so important in human life, then how are we to be led by God to choose that right person? So that's what this sermon is all about. I have three points to mention, all beginning with the letter C. The first is that we want to look at the criterion of God. What criterion did God use when He chooses a person? Moving on from that criterion, we look secondly at the caution. Although we will know the criterion, and the passage indicates quite clearly to us what this criterion is, embedded in this passage is also a caution for us. What is that caution? We shall try to find out later. Criterion, caution, and finally, comfort. Yes, this is the glory of God's word. When God chides, when God scolds, perhaps, if that's the way to describe it, at the end of the day, you see comfort and love. It is for our good. So what comfort can we derive from this passage? We shall explore that also. So three points, criterion, caution, comfort. So if you're to fall asleep after this, at least you got the key points, okay? So let's begin with the criterion of the Lord. First off, I want to say, 
from my heart that I thank God for this criterion because when the Lord tells us this is, this is His criterion, He's actually opening His heart to us. Why should God tell you His criterion, right? I'm sure you understand this. Those of us who have served in the army, NS, must the general explain to you all the time? He said, go, you do it. So the Lord could simply say, I choose this person, don't ask too many questions. He could have. And if he did that, we would submit ourselves to him. But that's not our God. The Almighty God, the High and Mighty One, decides to explain to us how he thinks, how he looks at things. That's his criterion. And I see here the grace of God. The grace is this, that God would be so kind as to tell us how he sees things. So what is this criterion? As you all would know from the introduction of the passage or the message, the criterion is that the Lord looks at the heart. Let's recall the incident again. Jesse had seven sons. The eldest was Eliab. Impressive. When Samuel saw him, he said, this surely must be the one. Impressive, right? You need an impressive leader, correct or not? You need someone that when he walks up, there's a hush. Everybody looks at him. Wow. You don't want someone who walks up, people don't even bother, look at their phones and start texting away. You want an impressive person. Okay, and maybe that's why in our society we talk about power dressing, how to present yourself, time your entry in such a way that it is impressive. Eliab is that kind of person, you see. Not easy to find. Impressive. And Samuel thought, surely he must be the one. And the Lord said, no. And then the second and the third and seven sons, I got very laborious. Seven sons, you know, still no. Probably the people will be there. Who is this God? Come on. Seven sons, still nobody. Didn't you say Jesse? Yeah, I say Jesse. We presented to you all seven sons. No. And then finally, David. Why was David chosen and not Eliab and the other brothers? It is because the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord explains, men look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. But what does it mean to say that God looks at the heart? What is the heart? Because the heart is internal, often hidden, the core of your being. And in your heart will be, of course, motivations, love, loyalty, so for God, these things are important, not the outward. What's important to the Lord will be the core of your being, your attitudes, your motivations, your loyalty, your love. That's what the Lord sees. And over time, it took me a long time to understand this, but I learned it. Over time, I come to understand in my life and in the lives of many people, when we do so-called surprising deeds, deeds that we are even surprised by, hey, I mean, I did that. Usually those deeds are done because of the strength of the heart. Let's try it again. Many people, though gifted, if the heart wills, if the heart is depressed and the internal strength gone, even though he may have those gifts, they may not be utilized well. The strong man may get flawed because the heart wills. Someone who's not expected to achieve anything, but because of the strength of the heart, he will achieve it. It took me a long time to understand this, and I reflected, yes, it is the strength of the heart. And the strength of the heart, of course, comes from love. Nothing strengthens the heart more than love for another person. I think you understand that, right? Look at him. There's a good example how we, people caught one another. When they're courting, the person may live in Jurong and you may live in Changi, the trip from Chang to Jurong. No problem. No problem at all. You will happily make the journey. After getting married and get tired, when your wife asks you to just go downstairs to buy a loaf of bread, wow, very hard. Just maybe 10 meters, very hard. So 10 meters was hard. But in the courtship days, 40 kilometers, no problem at all. The heart, the heart. 
I see this in my children. When they don't want to do anything, when the heart is not there, the simplest task is really difficult. When the heart is in it, like computer games, nobody can stay up for hours and not get tired. Make them study, 10 minutes they give up. The heart. So the Lord looks at the heart. We look at the outward. And the strength of the heart is important. So when the Lord looks at the heart, then we find David being the choice. The unexpected choice. Why is it unexpected? First of all, he's not even considered. Jesse had more than seven sons. Eight probably. The youngest was David. He was not considered. He was supposed to bring all his sons. He thought to himself, surely not my youngest. So he brought seven. And the seven were not chosen. So David was unexpected because unexpected choice to the people. He's not even considered at all. Now, but when he was brought before the Lord, this is what the narrator describes to us. He was young, he was ruddy, and he, was, he had beautiful eyes. I love this description. I'll tell you why. Let's begin with ruddy. Ruddy, that means a bit red, right? So what does a, pers- a ruddy person tell you? He's red because he's light-skinned. Light-skinned. Huh? So light skin may mean a bit fair. Fair means that maybe not tried and tested. You want a king. You don't want a fair person. You want a tough-looking man. I think you understand that, right? In my time growing up, we have this wrong idea that girls love boys that are tall, handsome and dark the tan look so the tanning industry made uh, it's not like leather but the industry involved in tanning bodies huh? they make a lot of money because people want that tan look you go to the beach you're all fair it doesn't look like today when i go and swim i resplendent we're not in heavenly glory but fair we want to be dark tan so that we look tough we look perhaps handsome david was ruddy and another reason why the word ruddy is used is that maybe it has to do with children, the child that just cried. Usually they begin life a bit ruddy, rosy cheeks. And as they get older, that rosiness gets lost. So David is still at that stage where the ruddiness can be seen. So the ruddy description tells us he's young, perhaps untried. Unlike his older brothers who have been out in the world, dark and ready to take on positions of leadership. David wasn't. He was young, so that's why he was sent to look after the sheep when the great ceremony was on, right? The sheep has to be looked after, right? So David looked after it. The brothers went to see Samuel in order that one may be anointed. So David was ruddy. But the text goes on to say, David was with beautiful eyes, handsome. Didn't the Lord say, he doesn't look at the outward? So if any Hollywood writer he probably would say, David was ugly, la, you know, there was a, maybe a handicap, la, you know, and he became king. We want that kind of story, right? What is happening in that kind of Hollywood story is what we call reverse prejudice. You know reverse prejudice? Let me explain. A bit like TTC. TTC sometimes with this idea, you know. The students with the A's will be bad pastors. Then we draw the conclusion. The students with F's We'll be good pastors. And then we realize that's rubbish. Students with A's may make bad pastors. Doesn't mean students with F's will make good pastors. They can be bad pastors too. The point is that whether A's or F's, that doesn't quite correlate with whether you're a good pastor. You see the point. But reverse prejudice means if an A person doesn't, cannot do it, then an F person will do it. But God says, no, that's looking at the outward again. Okay? God doesn't look at the outward. It doesn't mean that handsome man cannot serve the Lord. It doesn't mean a handsome man cannot be blessed by the Lord. The thing to remember is that the Lord does not look at the outward. Ugly has a doesn't matter. So when I read this, I say, praise be to God. This passage teaches us there's no such thing as reverse prejudice in Scripture. David was handsome, but was chosen not because he was handsome. But he was handsome nonetheless. You see the beauty of God's word? No reverse prejudice. Ah, we need to understand this because sometimes in our leadership, 
after learning, oh, the Lord looks at the inward, then the impressive man got rejected. So now we look for unimpressive people. The more unimpressive, the better. The worse dress, the better. No, that is wrong. That's again looking at the outward. When you look at the inward, whether it dresses impressively or unimpressively, doesn't matter. You look at the heart. So that's the power of God's word. God's word surprises me again and again. Not like Hollywood, not like America, not like the West. Not wokeism, not at all. The Lord chooses because He looks at the heart. That's the criterion of the Lord, the heart. Time's almost up. I've been belaboring the point. Let's move on to my second point. Caution. What is the caution here? Well, the caution is this. When I look at how the party involved in the worship reacted to David and to the other sons of Jesse, I see this big problem. It is a perennial problem that we have of judging according to the superficial. And this problem affects all kinds of people. In our text, the person who was affected, first of all, was Samuel. Let's hear this again. Samuel the prophet. Samuel, who when young heard the voice of the Lord, he should know better, right? He's Samuel after all, kingmaker, okay? And yet, he was afflicted by the same problem. Samuel also judged by the outward. And the Lord must teach Samuel not to do it. Wow, that means for us, wherever you may be in your spiritual, in your maturity, yeah, spiritually speaking, whatever ministry you, will, you may be, please take note of this. If it affects Samuel, it could easily affect you. This passage is also for you. It affected Samuel. Then secondly, we see it affected Jesse. Who was Jesse? Jesse is the father. Wow. We're talking about the family dynamics now. And as you sit down and think about it, this happens quite often, isn't it? Sometimes parents are like that. We size our children up according to wrong criteria, according to outward criteria, impressiveness. And then some son or daughter may fly under the radar, you know. Why? Because that father or that mother adopted this attitude, looking at the outward, not at the heart. And after a while, I hope it is soon, but some takes, in some cases it takes a long while, then we finally realize that, no, this is not good. I've made a big mistake. Pray to God, you don't do it. Of course, we, we've seen people, sons we like very much, at the end of the day, disappointing us. Wow. Our criterion are wrong to start with. Good example, Absalom. You know Absalom? He was a son David loved. I think David understands this. I mean, he should have realized it. He was chosen not because of impressive love. But Absalom was impressive, handsome, long flowing hair. As he walked around the nation, count out to him. He will be the king. And he was the son whom David loved. That's why David knew his general, don't rebel, don't take him down. David loved him very much, but he was the son who usurped his throne. Sad, isn't it? But we don't seem to learn lessons like this. Even parents are affected. Jesse, the father, wrote off his youngest son. It was only because of the Lord that the youngest son was brought back into consideration. So that's the caution to us. In our families, in our churches, this terrible idea of judging by the outward is always present. We must resist, must ask the Lord for help. So that is the cautionary tale told by this passage. Samuel, Jesse, the father, were both affected by that problem. We pray to God we won't be affected. But let me end now with a comfort. What then is the comfort? My message sounds so threatening, right? Oh, if Samuel did it, maybe I would do it too. You know? What comfort is that? 
Well, let's look at the words again. This is where the comfort is found. The Lord looks at the heart. And I praise God for that. I've talked to young people, my sons even, in their generation. Being impressive is so important. Being, how to put it, looked up to, you know, by the peers, identified as an influencer. <laughs> we like the term, influencer, right? And there's some of us who would be bypassed. A group of people out there, you may be the most gifted, maybe in that skill, bypass because not impressive. The same may be in church. You have this so-called great idea to serve the Lord, you know, and then great ideas to give, but not considered. What the passage tells us, the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord recognizes. The Lord knows what you're thinking. The Lord knows your good thoughts. The Lord knows your love for Him. Others may not, but the Lord knows. And some of us, maybe, we have, to, we have all these great schemes. If only I'm given an opportunity to do it. Maybe the opportunity never came. But the Lord knows what your thoughts were. Recently, I've been led to reflect on some of these things. And that is, uh, there may be people in our midst who have great desires for the Lord. And sometimes we die without those desires being fulfilled. It's true. Not all of us will die with desires fulfilled. Maybe, if you think of it in a reverse way, those who die with desires fulfilled maybe have very few desires. Those with many and great desires for the Lord often die without those desires fulfilled. And the great thing is that the Lord knows. And the Lord treasures all these desires you have for Him. And often, it is over time. Over time, maybe the next generation which have impacted, they will bring those desires to pass. I say this because as I study people like Paul and all those, there's a good, good chance that certain ideas that going to Spain may not, perhaps didn't even materialize at all, but he desired it for the Lord. And the Lord recognizes that. Similarly us. I do not know how much you love the Lord, and I do pray you love the Lord. And if you do love the Lord, you would have great desires. Maybe to see your neighbors safe. Maybe to see some segments in society transform. You started work, but maybe a small work. The grand results you hope to see did not come, and you die. But it doesn't mean the work stopped. In time to come, perhaps that work will be fulfilled. It's a bit like Hebrews 11, right? Where you have the patriarchs being shown by God a land, a city, like Abraham, this is the land given to you. Abraham did not own it. He died without owning it. But God's promise remained true, and it came to pass. So Hebrews 11 tells us, they saw the city from afar, and they believed, and they treasured it. Some of you are like that. No chance to explain, no chance to show it, or bury it in your heart, but the Lord knows the heart. And the Lord treasures it. For me, that's a comfort. But let me now end. I'll end with a very interesting anecdote from my life about choosing the right person and how unexpectedly. I am very, very seldom asked to speak on topics about BGR, boy girl relationship to the youth. And I do not know what to say. It just happens, you know. Praise God for it. How? I really don't. How I got married? I don't. But anyway, there was once I was asked to, to speak. So I, I did my best to speak, yeah. And then uh, teaching them the principles, you know. I, I did it because this friend of mine was a youth worker, even though he was in his 40s. So, huh? 
You must be joking. 40 youth workers. Yeah. So I said, okay, I told him, if you are willing to be a youth worker in your so-called middle age, I'll speak for you. So I went to speak on that topic. And at the end, someone asked a very serious question, okay? And the question was, it was the boy who asked it. He said, there's this girl whom I, I like very much, a very good girl, very, very good girl, but not pretty. <laughs> Pastor, what should I do? So my, my thoughts are racing away. There's some good thoughts I have. I wanted to say some, but I think I blurted out something that didn't come out right. And my initial words were this. And I look at him, I say, you're not so handsome yourself. <laughs> ah. <laughs> then I thought to myself, oh dear, what did I say? <laughs> of course, what my, the, the thoughts in my head were two. One, we tend to over-glamorize these things. Really. My, my wife taught me that people who are called Naito in, in, man, uh, in Teochew, they get beauty. Uh, more about pretty over the years, isn't it? Yeah. So my wife taught me that. <laughs> so I thought I wanted to teach him, teach him that. to teach that man, but it came out like that. You're not very handsome yourself. But there was, second, there was a second reason I said it. I say, I, I didn't tell him that, but in my mind I said, I don't want you to marry her because you took pity on her. Yeah, I didn't tell her you're not so pretty, you know, but I love you. No, 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 no. You're not so handsome yourself. So I thought, oh. But it shouldn't come out that way. It came out that way. So I thought, done, done for. What a four par, you know. But what happened next surprised me. The youth broke out into clapping, you know. <laughs> they clapped. <laughs> Why they clapped? Maybe, maybe this boy thought of himself as God's gift to girls, you know. I am God's son. So the people thought, you had your come up today, okay? You're not so handsome yourself, you know. The preacher said that himself. I, I do not know what that was, but they all clapped. So that got me reflecting. I shared with my wife. My wife said, you did the right thing. <laughs> anyway, of course, what I wanted to say is this. Preaching is not used to for insulting people. It was not meant to insult people. But that led me to think about this passage and what I want to teach the young people. When you choose a spouse, look at the heart. Look at the heart. And sometimes we want a beautiful girl because we think, oh, I am Mr. Handsome. I deserve the Miss Universe. I want to say, dream on. You're not so handsome yourself. <laughs> oh, look at your mirror. Of course, it's not meant to insult, it's to bring you down a bit so that you get more realistic. And then realize all these ideas of handsomeness, prettiness, where did they come from? Not from the Lord. The Lord looked at the heart. And let us learn to be like the Lord. Look at the heart. When we look at people, let us learn to look at the heart. Value the heart. Thank God for people who heartily serve the Lord, who heartily love you. Look at the heart and let us ask the Lord for grace and strength to be people of the heart. Finally, if the Lord looks at the heart, let us ask God to teach us to cultivate the heart because out of the heart are the issues of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for looking at my heart. And you know, Lord, how I and members here often struggle. We, we struggle with our terrible thoughts, stuff here and there. But you look at the deepest of our hearts. And you know we love you, Lord. Though imperfect, our love may be, you treasure that love. And that's our comfort today. Thank you, Lord. And because you look at the heart, teach us now to use this criterion as we look at people, for your kingdom's sake and for the sake of harmony in this world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.